It's the morning of April 14th, 2021. It's a beautiful start to the day in Munich, Germany. Nothing seems out of the ordinary as you wake up and start your day. That is, until you take a glance out of your window and see the armed German police executing a raid on your next door neighbor's house. They come out with a 49-year-old male whose name has not been disclosed. Along with the suspect, they also conduct a search on their house and seize their computer. Unbeknownst to you at the time, one year prior, the Department of Homeland Security would commence an operation codenamed Operation Liberty Lane. This document was not leaked until January 2024. It wasn't until September 2024, less than a year ago, that the details of this story came to light and the safety and privacy of Tor was questioned. At the same time as the first police raid, similar events transpire on the other side of the country in a city called Paderborn, Germany. Here, they arrest a 40-year-old male whose name has also not been released. At the same time, the third and final suspect, who was a 58-year-old male, was detained in Paraguay under an international arrest warrant issued by a court in Frankfurt, Germany. They were set to be placed on a flight and transported back to Germany shortly. All three men were sentenced in December 2022 to 12 years, 10.5 years, and 8 years in prison. What these men all had in common was that they were the admins for a website being hosted on the Tor network as an onion service. The website, known as Boys Town, first launched in June 2019 and was among the largest websites of its kind, known to serve explicit imagery to over 400,000 registered users. One of the most active users, uploading over 3.5 thousand posts, was identified as a 64-year-old man from Hamburg, Germany, who was arrested and sentenced to seven years in prison. All of these people were Tor users who were successfully de-anonymized by one of the most complex and well-coordinated cyber operations in history, ran by an alliance of intelligence agencies, including a slew of three-letter agencies from the United States, including the FBI, Europol, Germany, the Netherlands, and more. Tor is a project that was first built by the United States Navy in 2002 later becoming a non-profit in 2006. Tor is both a browser and a series of protocols designed to keep you anonymous and untraceable on the internet. In fact, the United States government first created Tor for the purposes of keeping its own military internet traffic a secret. Due to the ability to remain anonymous, cyber criminals are known to use Tor for their own purposes. De-anonymizing a Tor user is no easy task. It was only made possible due to the collaboration of multiple different countries' intelligence agencies, which was made possible due to the 14 Eyes Alliance, containing countries such as the US, the Netherlands, and most importantly in this case, Germany. It was multiple different, independent sources of information that these countries were able to piece together in order to de-anonymize these users. These methods included the control and surveillance of a significant share of Tor relays, as well as a court order issued to the German ISP Telefonica, mandating them to disclose which customers connected to these law enforcement controlled Tor relays. This is in addition to an outdated chat client and the infiltration of undercover law enforcement into private chat rooms. All of these signals were correlated using a timing analysis in order to de-anonymize the users. Before we get ahead of ourselves, let's take a step back and understand how the Tor network works. Before we explain how Tor keeps you anonymous, let's talk about regular internet traffic. Let's say that this is your computer, and this is a web server that you want to reach. Your internet service provider, or ISP, will provide you with an IP address, and will provide you with the infrastructure needed to route traffic through the internet. If you were to just send your traffic directly to the web server, without any protections at all, your ISP would know both your IP address and the IP address of the server that you sent traffic to, which they could share with law enforcement. Some people plan to get around this by using a VPN. A VPN works by encrypting your traffic and sending it through a secure tunnel to the VPN server. At this point, the VPN server will decrypt the traffic and relay it to the web server. This means that the traffic flowing from your PC to the VPN server is private, even to your ISP. They'll still see the traffic, but it is encrypted traffic. Once the traffic is decrypted on the VPN server and is sent to the web server, it will no longer contain your IP address, 
as this would have been swapped out with the IP of the VPN server. While this might seem secure to third parties, you are placing massive trust into your VPN provider as they are a single point of failure. If law enforcement goes to your VPN provider, they may give up your personal data or even let them spy on your traffic. Now, we turn to Tor. Tor, which stands for the Onion Router, is a decentralized network consisting of nearly 10,000 relays. When you route traffic through the Tor network, rather than going through a single Tor relay, it will be routed through three separate Tor relays. Rather than being hosted by a single party, these 10,000 relays are hosted all over the world by volunteers. Even you can volunteer to host a Tor relay on your computer right now. Now, when traffic is routed through the Tor network, it will be wrapped in three different layers of encryption, with each Tor relay having its own encryption key to decrypt only a single layer at a time. Unlike with a VPN, this means that there is no single point of failure. When your PC sends traffic to the first relay, known as a guard node, your traffic will be introduced into the Tor network. This guard node only knows your real IP address and the IP address of the next node. It does not know the IP address of the exit node or of the final destination. And of course, due to the encryption, it cannot see the contents of your traffic either. The middle node will only know the IP addresses of the guard node and of the exit node, not your personal IP or the destination IP. Lastly, the exit node will be aware of the destination IP and of the middle node's IP, but of course, not your personal IP. In order to piece together and see someone's Tor traffic, you would need to either compromise or control all three relays that their traffic flows through. While this is theoretically possible, it is nearly impossible to pull off in the real world, not to mention that the specific three relays that are chosen are always changing. You see, when Tor routes traffic, it has a very important algorithm that carefully selects which three relays to use. For example, it will ensure that all three relays are in different countries, belonging to different ISPs, and have different IP address blocks assigned to them, among other criteria. International intelligence agency alliances, such as the 14 Eyes Alliance, can make the separation of these nodes more difficult. I highlighted Germany's involvement in the 14 Eyes Alliance earlier. It turns out that one third of all Tor relays in the world are being hosted in Germany, followed by 15% in the Netherlands and nearly 10% in the United States. You might be thinking that these intelligence agencies banded together to host a large amount of Tor nodes in the hopes of having their targets use all three of their nodes, but interestingly enough, they don't actually need to get you to use all three of their nodes. Not only would this be a very complex and expensive operation due to the amount of nodes they would need to host to make this feasible, but it would also be nearly impossible to set up these nodes without anybody noticing. Instead, they use a much more feasible and sophisticated attack known as a guard discovery attack. Let's take a look at how this works. We'll refer to the intelligence agencies conducting this attack as the attacker, and their target in this case would be the web server hosting the website that they are after, whose domain would have ended in .onion. Now, we can think of the first relay that this server is connected to as the server's guard node. The attacker would still need to host a moderate amount of Tor nodes themselves. Now, to begin the attack, the attacker starts by opening up a large amount of connections to the server. Each connection will have different Tor relays from around the world selected to form its circuit. Eventually, since the attacker is opening up a high volume of connections, one of these connections will include an attacker ran node as the middle node in the circuit. At this point in time, recall what I mentioned earlier. Each node is aware of the true IP address of the node that comes before it and the node that comes after it. In this case, this means that the attacker-controlled middle node is aware of the true IP address of the guard node for the web server. This is all the attacker needs in this case. Now that they are able to identify the guard node that the Onion service is connected to, they can now focus their efforts onto hacking into or surveilling the guard node, which of course knows the true IP address of the actual web server. 
This attack in isolation isn't enough for de-anonymization. It is only meant to reveal the location of the guard node for a target, which will come in handy shortly. The cool thing is that this attack can also be done in reverse, on the Tor client, in order to find the true location of a guard node for a user that's using the Tor browser. They would need to trick the user's browser into making a high volume of connections to different .onion sites, all controlled by a single attacker. In this case, something like this can be pulled off quite easily, since if you manage to trick the user into visiting a single malicious .onion site, you could embed a bunch of images hosted on attacker-controlled .onion sites within the HTML of the page, forcing the user's browser into making a bunch of requests. This is basically just the same thing, but in reverse, so don't worry if you don't understand the specifics of this. At the end of the day, the point is to identify a user's guard node. Remember at the start of the video when I said it was multiple different sources of information that needed to be pieced together in order to de-anonymize these users? Knowing the true location of the guard nodes was the first piece of information. It wouldn't provide too much value alone, but any amount of information can be a good starting point. The second piece of information that they used was data from a German ISP known as Telefonica, which was court order to turn over customer data to the feds. Specifically, they were interested in knowing which users were connecting to the previously identified guard nodes. Recall that the guard node, being the first hop, is aware of the user's real IP address. Since the ISP is needed to route the initial traffic from the user's PC to the guard node, the ISP is aware of both the user's IP and of the guard node's IP. Since the feds now knew the IP addresses of the guard nodes from the guard discovery attack, they can match this up with the data received from the ISP, and then be able to know the IP addresses and identities of the suspect. Now, this leaves one big question. Is Tor still secure? To answer this question, we must take a look at the final part of the story. All the way back in 2018, Tor created something called Vanguards in order to protect against guard discovery attacks. If you use Vanguards, a guard discovery attack should not be possible. Due to the nature of this story, we're all going off of limited information, and even the Tor project themselves don't know all of the details. But from what we do know, it looks like the suspects did not use vanguards, which is what left them vulnerable to the guard discovery attack in the first place. You might be asking, why would they decide to not use such an important security feature? It turns out that the website, Boys Town, had exclusive chat rooms, which used the chat software Ricochet. It turns out that there are two different versions of Ricochet. There was the original Ricochet software, which did not include vanguards, and was thus vulnerable to a discard discovery attack, and then there was Ricochet Refresh, a fork of the original Ricochet that was updated to include vanguards. It looks like the only reason why the feds were able to pull off this guard discovery attack in the first place was due to the fact that the suspects were using the original version of Ricochet, which lacked vanguards. Had they been using the newer version with Vanguard's protection, they may have not been caught. This wasn't the only role that Ricochet played either. The feds actually went undercover and partook in live chats with the suspects, allowing them to know the exact times that chats were sent and received. They actually used this information to perform a timing analysis, also called a traffic correlation analysis, by matching these chats against spikes in traffic of equal size on the middle nodes they were running and on the guard nodes that they were surveilling. This timing analysis helped to narrow down the search for the correct guard nodes during the guard discovery attack. The ISP data was then paired with this afterward in order to identify who was using these guard nodes. It was all of these factors combined that allowed them to successfully de-anonymize the suspects and take down Boys Town. Lastly, it was also speculated that the suspects might have disclosed identifiable information to the undercover law enforcement officers in the chat rooms, which could have further narrowed down the search, although I'm not sure that this was ever publicly confirmed. Overall, this was one of the most widespread and sophisticated operations we've seen, requiring the collaboration of multiple different nations' intelligence agencies, government-controlled and surveilled Tor relays, customer data disclosure from an ISP, a now-deprecated chat client lacking vanguards, 
and the infiltration of undercover law enforcement into the website's chat rooms. If even one of these factors was left out, it would have been significantly more difficult, if at all possible, to de-anonymize these users. It took quite a while for all of this information to be pieced together as it wasn't directly made public. It wasn't until September 2024 that additional information came to light and Tor issued an official statement. If you've made it this far, you might be interested in subscribing to the channel and checking out some of my other content. And as always, thanks for watching.